everyone. Um, welcome to the first of several exam reviews. <clears throat> I'll try and get through the first maybe two or three chapters um, in this one and keep the videos relatively short so that you can focus in on the chapters that you're interested in or the ones that you feel like you need, need the most review for. Um, the, the format that I usually use is just to go through the study guide and talk about things that uh, students seem to struggle with the most or I get the most questions about um, either in my CETA class or in online discussion forums. Um, so um, with that, if you've got your own copy of the study guide, great. If not, now's a good time to um, pull that up. <clears throat> um, so in chapter one, chapter one was a long time ago. That was the beginning of the semester. Um, the very beginning of that, that's not a concept that's in the book, but it's something that we've talked about in class. Um, and it's the difference between scientific or what we call empirical evidence and anecdotal evidence. So when you think about um, stories that you might have and say, you know, in my life, here's what I've experienced, um, and so this is what I think. That's an anecdote, and it doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, it can inform your research, it can inform your views, um, and then you can look for more evidence for that. Um, but the, there's a saying in psychology or in social sciences um, that the plural of anecdote is not data. In other words, just because you've seen it in two or three different places doesn't make it so. Um, and, and that's true for other people as well, that what we want is scientific evidence. What you want out of this course is not Kim Eaton's view, um, of how development unfolds. What you would like is, uh, what do we know based on scientific evidence? So I think we should all hold ourselves to that scientific standard. Um, and that's why I put that front and center on the, uh, on the study guide. Um, nature and nurture, pretty obvious. Um, epigenetics is the study of the interrelationship between genes and the environment. You can have the gene for something, but it isn't necessarily expressed um, unless there's some sort of an environment or tr environmental trigger or environmental event. Um, so epigenetics is understanding how, um, how genes and the environment um, collide or, or um, you know, work together um, to produce development in a particular way. Um, critical and sensitive periods. Uh, I think this is a really important concept. Um, a critical period is when something must happen in order for development to proceed the way it's supposed to. Sensitive periods are when it's better, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen at that time. Um, an example of a critical period would be um, the, um, during the, um, the embryonic period um, is a critical period for organ formation. So if your heart hasn't formed properly or if your hand hasn't formed properly um, during the embryonic period, it's not going to form correctly later. In other words, you don't have the opportunity to do that again. Um, on the other hand, if you don't learn to read by first grade, you know, a lot of kids are learning to read in kindergarten and, and sounding words out. Um, if you don't learn to read until first grade or second grade, it doesn't mean that you won't ever be a good reader. Um, it might, you know, it might be indicative of some sort of a learning delay or disability, um, but it might be that, that that's a sensitive period and it's easier if you learn it then, but you would be able to pick it up later on if you needed to. Um, so sensitive periods have much more leeway. Um, critical periods, it has to happen then or it won't happen at all. Um, so that's, uh, that's the difference there. Um, three domains of development. Um, if you think about how your book is laid out, um, biological or physical development, cognitive development and psychosocial development. And so all of those things are important. They all interact um, to help us understand a person at any particular stage of the lifespan, uh, but they're separate domains and we, we ask and answer different questions at that time. Um, Bronfenbrenner's uh, theory is a very complex theory. It's, hard, it's a hard one to understand all in one place. Um, it's one that's used in sociology, it's used in anthropology, it's used in psychology. It's that idea that there are all these interacting systems and unless you can understand all of those systems, you can't completely predict development in a particular way. Um, so if you're trying to understand the development of a particular child, you need to know the child and know how that child interacts with their own family, their friends, their um, siblings, their teachers, um, their microsystem. But then as you expand out, you know, the child lives in a community and what's that community like? And they live in a, uh, in a, in a society and so what are the economic uh, uh, elements that are going on at that time? So there are a lot of variables that can change and that will influence people's development in ways that we can't predict well, uh, but we know that they all have an influence. In addition to all of that, there's the chrono system and that's the idea that um, all of these things change across time. So, you know, the development that you have as a college student is different than the development that I had as a college student, in part because we, we uh, experience those things at different times in history. So um, the effect of a, a particular historical period on the development. If you want to understand my views on uh, politics, um, then, you know, understanding that part of what I learned about politics was 
um, during the Watergate era, right? And so I had a very different, you know, as a high school student during the Watergate era, I had a very different view of politics than somebody might have who came of age at a different historical period. So um, those are the kinds of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about Bronf and Brenner's model. I'm not going to get too deep on, on the final exam on that, but I think just being aware of that model and in particular being aware of the chrono system because it comes up a lot when you're trying to understand people who are either younger than you or older than you. Um, socioeconomic status gets bantered about a lot, so I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to look up the definition for that one, um, what it is and isn't. Um, a lot of times when we're trying to understand differences in test scores, um, differences in uh, reading ability, performance, um, how adolescents act, you know, one of the things that we look at is their socioeconomic status. You know, did they grow up in poverty? Um, did they have a good education system? Did, were their parents educated? You know, what, what was the, their environment, so to speak, as they were growing up? Um, social constructions um, are, um, adolescence is a social construction, emerging adulthood is a, is a social construction. We've decided that that's a part of the lifespan that differs from the periods before and after it, um, each of those, um, and that they're worthy of study in and of themselves. And so, but we've decided that if you went to another culture, another country, another period in time, you wouldn't find emerging adulthood, or you might not even find adolescence if you went back far enough. So. Um, you know, when our lifespan was 47 years old, we didn't need as many divisions of the, of the lifespan, but now we do. So those are, society is making those decisions, um, and that's an evolving thing. Um, plasticity, uh, I get a lot of questions about plasticity. If you think about something that's plastic, um, it can be molded. Um, and if you break it or injure it in some way, sometimes it can bounce back and you can repair it. You can heat it up and, and reshape it in some way. The brain has uh, a certain amount of plasticity. It can uh, rebound from an injury. It can, um, if somebody loses their sight, certain parts of the brain um, can be, you'll see more neuronal activity in areas that are associated with hearing and touch. So there is some plasticity in the brain. It's not completely plastic though. Um, or, you know, it can't become something completely different. So it is plastic, but um, it can't become metal. So, you know, it, uh, plasticity has its limits. Um, and it's just a concept that we, that we talk about um, when we're referring to resilience um, and the degree to which some, uh, something might be able to uh, rebound from an injury. Um, the approaches to development are those different theoretical bases, um, the psychodynamic theory, cognitive theory, evolutionary theory, and so on. So um, you're probably familiar with those, um, partly because of the study of this semester and partly because of your introductory psychology course, but if not, take a look at those. Um, they all um, converge on uh, helping us to understand development, but they ask and answer different questions. They're looking at different aspects of the human condition, and so that's why we need all of them. Um, assimilation and accommodation, I get a lot of questions about. Um, assimilation is um, adding more detail to something that you already have some sort of a mental schema for. So if you already have an idea about um, how something works or what something is, and then you get one more piece of information, and one of the examples that I use in class is uh, when, you, when we were talking about end of life and we were talking about um, the different uh, customs associated with what happens after somebody dies, um, I asked you to listen to the Miss Thien uh, video, not video, excuse me, the audio um, story. Um, and in that case, I remember listening to that for the first time and thinking that's a completely different way of dealing with um, the, the rituals associated with after somebody has died than what I was familiar with. Um, and so for me, that required accommodation because I now needed a new schema for how those things, those events can play out within somebody's home. And that wasn't something that I had experience with. Um, however, um, had I just learned a little bit more about something else somebody did with the kind of funeral system that I was already familiar with, that would have been assimilation. So there's sort of a blurry line between when you actually are accommodating, when you're assimilating. But if you think of drastic changes or something completely new and you need a new schema for it, um, then, uh, then that would be accommodation. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, evolutionary theory. Um, evolutionary theory is a good story. Uh, it's hard to get any scientific evidence for it though. You, know, you can't do an experiment that lasts 10,000 years. I'm sorry to say if that's a news flash to you, I hate to spoil, spoil that uh, idea for you. Um, and so evolutionary theory is interesting, but it's largely theoretical um, because it's difficult for us to really understand uh, human motivation and human behavior um, in a scientific way 
um, based on evolution because we just haven't we don't have the data uh, that we need for some of those things. So um, so I'll leave that there, um, and you can think about that. Um, and then um, finally, correlations. Um, a correlation does not include causation. You already know that. Um, strong correlations, a correlation of 0.7 or 0.8 suggest that um, if you know the value of one thing, you know the value of the other thing with a relatively high degree of certainty. Um, so if I have 10 questions that are all measuring your agreeableness on a personality questionnaire, um, and the correlation among those items is 0.8, what it means is I don't need to ask 10 questions because they're all measuring the same thing, and if I know your answer on one, I kind of know your answer on the others. I might want more than one. I might want three or four questions, but I might not need eight. Um, on the other hand, if the correlation was 0.3 or 0.4, then they, that would suggest that they're, it's a low correlation. They're measuring different things because your answer on one in no way tells me, you know, with any degree of certainty, what your answer will be on the other one. Um, so that's you know how we interpret correlations. Positive correlation of 0.8 and a negative correlation of 0.8 are equally strong and equally informative. It's just that if it's a positive correlation, um, both values are either going up at the same time or down at the same time. Um, and if it's a negative correlation, they're going in opposite directions, uh, but, but its predictive ability um, is the same um, if, it's, if the correlation is same. So that sign change doesn't change the strength, it just changes the direction of the variables. Okay, um, so that's chapter one. Um, chapter two is a lot of definitions. And so I would encourage you, um, if you haven't already, to use the flashcards um, if these terms aren't, uh, aren't uh, familiar to you, and I encourage you to do that for all of the chapters. I think anytime you're going into a test, um, the more familiar you, are, familiar you are with all the vocabulary, the more quickly you can uh, read a question and then look at the possible answers and discard the ones that are clearly not the one um, and you know perhaps narrow it down to one or two that would be the right answer. So familiarity with the vocabulary can be very, very helpful, and the online flashcards that are provided by the publisher I think are a really good way to do that. Um, so, uh, so having said that, um, as you're looking through and reviewing chapter two, um, remember what the main things are that happen in those three prenatal periods. You know, in one, it's largely cell division in the germinal period. Um, in the embryonic period, it's largely organogenesis and the formation of the body. Um, and then during the fetal period, it's largely growth of things that have already been formed, and in particular, brain growth. Um, so that's helpful to know so that uh, if there's some sort of a problem during the pregnancy, you have an idea of what the impact might be based on the number of weeks of development that have, uh, that have already occurred. Um, uh, so that's that. Um, genotype and phenotype um, definition, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, polygenic and multifactorial both refer to there are, there are a number of things that can contribute to development in a particular way. Polygenic is the idea that um, if something has a genetic component, if it's heritable, um, that it's usually um, many genes or, or a number of genes that are contributing to that. So in that sense, it's polygenic. There's not anything that we know of in the, in the psychological realm that is a one gene, one outcome correspondence. So they're all polygenic to the extent that they are um, genetically transmitted. Multifactorial includes polygenic. So multifactorial includes the effects of genes, but also other factors. So when you're looking at a child that may have, um, you know, be doing really well in school, what is predicting that? Well, part of it may be genetic, and it, and it may be some of those variables associated with temperament or personality or intelligence or you know, any number of things. But part of it is also environmental. You know, what kind of a school is he going to or she going to? What kind of a, a teacher relationship do they have? Um, you know, those kinds of things. So what is their health like? Um, so in that sense, it's multifactorial. It's not just genes, it's genes plus other things. Um, okay, um, epigenetics, um, just because you have the gene for something doesn't mean that you'll have that thing. So um, an example of that would be schizophrenia, which is outside the, the realm of this course, but when you think about schizophrenia, um, if, you, if your identical twin has schizophrenia, then you have a 50% uh, likelihood of also developing the disease. So we know that it's not 100%, which means that it's, it's uh, not just genetic, but also, so it's multifactorial, it's genes plus the environment, um, but you may have the gene and it may never be expressed. And so epigenetics is, what are, what's the relationship between the genes and the environment? When is a gene expressed and not expressed? Does it get turned on later? Does it get turned on um, because of a particular stressor or trigger in the environment? Um, and that's the study of, of epigenetics. Um, the age of viability uh, is uh, the earliest age at which the, uh, the organism can survive outside of the womb. Um, and 
currently that is at about 22 weeks, 21 to 22 weeks. Um, and there seems to be um, some consensus in the field that it's not going to go any lower than that. But as soon as we say that, somebody will take it lower than that. Um, so it's clearly not optimal um, to, uh, to be born at that age. Um, but if it does happen, um, that's, the age of that's what the age of viability means. The APGAR score we've talked about before, and you've seen it on other tests, so I'll leave that one for you to review on your own. Um, teratogens and the importance of timing. Exposure to a teratogen during the germinal period uh, interferes with cell division, and usually it either doesn't meet the threshold, or if it does meet the threshold, the pregnancy is terminated. Um, a teratogen um, that you're exposed to during the embryonic period will affect organogenesis. So when you think about physical development, then you think about it uh, interfering with that in some way. Um, and then teratogens during the, uh, during the fetal period, again, you know, interfering with growth, interfering with brain growth in particular. Um, and so you can, you can look at the timing of those things and say dosage matter, timing matters, and threshold matters. There are certain things that are a teratogen only when the exposure reaches a certain level. So uh, I don't think anybody would ever encourage anyone to test that or to try and push the limits on that. Um, but at least we know that um, small exposures of some things um, aren't harmful. Um, small exposures of other things are harmful, and so it's important to know what the teratogen in it is and what the threshold is for that, uh, for that particular thing. And then finally in chapter two, um, heritability. Uh, heritability is a tough concept for a lot of people. Um, it's not measuring whether or not something can be inherited. What it's measuring is, or even how much of it is inherited, it's measuring uh, within some particular thing that could be inherited, there's variability. Um, and uh, it varies in a population, and some portion of that variability can be attributed to genes, and some portion of that variability in that, in that outcome or that characteristic can be attributed to the environment. So when you're looking at the genetic component or the heritable component, um, you're measuring uh, how much of, of the variability can be predicted based on genes and not how much of the whole thing. So um, reread the definition of that one and, and try and think about that. I think it's important because when news articles come up in, in your future life and career, um, they will say, it turns out this is inherited or it turns out that is inherited. And buried in that article, what you'll find is that co correlation coefficient of 0.7 or 0.5 or whatever it is, is a heritability coefficient. And so it's not saying 70% of this thing was inherited, it's 70% of the variability in this thing can be attributed to genes. And that's a different and a much smaller uh, amount. Um, so I think it's important to point out. Um, chapter three, and that's the last chapter that's gonna be in this video. Um, chapter three, um, transient exuberance and pruning. Um, evolution uh, has provided us with you know, the, the brains that we have on the day that we're born. Um, and on the day that we're born, evolution doesn't know where we're gonna find ourselves. We may find ourselves in a rural community and farming. We may find ourselves in an urban environment. <clears throat> we may find ourselves in a risky environment, any, any number of places. Um, and so transient exuberance means you have a lot more um, potential connections in your brain than you, than you need. Um, and some of those will get used because of the experiences you have. And those pathways will be strengthened and they will be retained. <clears throat> but the ones that don't get used because of the place that you landed, um, then uh, those ones, uh, some of them will be pruned away to make the, the machine, so to speak, the brain more efficient. Um, and so transient exuberance and pruning are a good thing. Um, and it provides us with the capability um, to respond to our environment. And then whatever we're, environment we're exposed to, that's the one that we will, uh, we will strengthen those pathways. Um, reflexes, um, you watched a video on reflexes and, and there are a number of those. Most of them are exactly what they sound like. Um, the Moro reflex and the Babinski reflex are ones that are named after the people that, um, that discovered them. One of those being the startle reflex and the other one being that toe fan reflex. So um, those are ones to know um, in addition to swallowing and eye blink, which are swallowing and, and blinking your eyes. So there you go. Um, proximodistal and cephalocaudal. Proximodistal is, uh, sorry, I did that the opposite way. Proximodistal is the idea that uh, both prenatally and postnatally you develop from the inside out. Um, and so you get um, gross motor skills before you get fine motor skills. Things are getting more complex and more developed from an, in an inside out fashion. Um, and this is with respect to physical development. Also top down, cephalocaudal. So the child, when they're first born, can um, turn their head and open their eyes and, and direct their eye gaze, um, but they can't sit up. Um, and then later on, by about six months, they can sit up by themselves. And by about 12 months, they can walk by themselves. So it's that idea that things are developing and getting more um, uh, 
uh, more efficient and more effective in a top-down way. So cephalocaudal and proximal distal. It happens prenatally as well when you're looking at the watching an organism develop. What you see is top-down development and inside-out development. Um, gross and fine motor skills, um, I think those are pretty evident and uh, easy to understand. Um, the milestones for sitting uh, unsupported and walking, I think are important because um, if you're, you know, if somebody hands you a baby and says, here, I found this baby, I don't know how old it is, um, there are certain things that um, can tell you right away about how old that child is. You can, you can narrow the range a lot, even if you don't have a lot of experience with children. One is when they can sit up. If a child can't yet sit up, they're probably under six months of age. And if they can, they're over six months of age. If they can sit up, but they're just start, they look like they're walking, but they've only just started to walking, they're right around a year. Um, so there's some variability there, but it at least gets you in the ballpark of understanding how old a child might be. Um, later on, when you think about uh, language, um, the child that's babbling might be seven or eight or nine months old. The child that has first words might be around a year old. Um, the child that has two word sentences, go store, um, you know, you know, you know, go mommy, like go with mommy. Um, those two word sentences are at around 21 months to two years of age. Um, and then there's sort of a rapid explosion after that. So um, it helps you to understand how old the child is. Um, and I would encourage you if you're around people who have small children and, and you're conversing with them, um, sort of guess how old their child is and then ask them. Um, how old their child is and see how close you can get. It doesn't take you very long to get pretty good at, um, at discerning how old uh, people's children are and they love to talk about their children. People love to talk about themselves and their children. Um, uh, okay, um, object permanence um, is the idea that things continue to exist when hidden. Um, so you know, if, if I hide something from your view, um, you know that it's still there, but that's why children find peekaboo so interesting because um, they sort of forget that it's there and then boom, it reappears. It's almost like magic. They're not sure how you do it, but, but you, they think you're very clever. Um, the A not B error is the idea that children perseverate. They continue to look for something where they last found it and not where they watched you hide it, um, which was something that psychologists were really interested in. What did that say about children's uh, thinking um, because if they watch you hide it here, they watch you hide it here, they watch you hide it here, and each time they find it and they, they, they uncover it and grab it, and then right in front of you, them, you hide it over under the cloth over here, they still look for it over here even though they just watched you do it. And so that's clearly not something that, uh, that is indicative of adult-like thinking. What is it that's, uh, that's getting children to do that? Um, and the answer seems to be that they perseverate and they continue to do that one thing even when it no longer is working. Um, so that's a, a, an interesting, and then at some point they develop out of that, and so that's a sign of further cognitive development. Um, deferred imitation, sometimes children will um, imitate things that they've seen later on, and so you can tell that they're still thinking about it um, and still considering it, and they will imitate it um, in an effort to play it out and understand it better. Um, a lot of times when children are play acting or engaging in sociodramatic play, they're taking on a role and then seeing how that would go. How would it feel to do that thing? Um, why does somebody do that thing? What happens when they do that thing? Um, so they're really learning a lot from play at this time, um, which is one of the reasons that um, psychologists and pediatricians don't want children to have screen time. They want them to have actual play time is because it really engages their creative thought and helps them to understand things better um, if they're actually doing it rather than observing it. Observing it, you can learn something, um, but it's, it's definitely not the same um, and not as beneficial. Um, Child-directed speech, um, you know, I, uh, children don't learn from just being exposed to things around them. They learn from things being directed to them. Um, the components of child-directed speech are that you slow down um, and you engage in what we used to call baby talk. It's a high pitch. Um, it's a sing-song thing. Children find it in any culture. Um, parents seem to do it. Caregivers seem to do it. And children find it engaging. So um, it's interesting to them and it's, those are the components of, of child-directed speech. Um, language we've already talked about, so I'm going to stop there. That's enough. That's a long enough video, uh, probably too long, uh, for those first three chapters. Um, then the next video or series of videos will go through um, chapters, you know, three to four chapters per video um, to get you ready for the exam. So I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post them online. Thanks.